In this video, I will discuss how the lung lesions that are listed here will affect the breath sounds on auscultation, how it will affect the sound of percussion, whether it would be dull or hyper-resonant, how it would affect the transmission of vibrations through the lungs, the other term for which is frematous. And the way you can perform this test is to place the ulnar side of your hands on the patient's back and ask them to repeat the number 99. And this way you can feel the vibrations transmitting through the patient's lungs. And then finally, whether the trachea will deviate towards or away from the lesions. So with pleural effusions, there are fluids that are present in the pleural space with atelectasis, Part of the lung or the entire lung could have been collapsed. With pneumothorax, there is air that is inside the pleural cavity. And then finally, with the consolidation, there are fluids that are inside the lung itself, whether it could be from pneumonia or pulmonary edema. So with the pleural effusions as well as pneumothorax, since there is either fluid or air that is present inside the pleural space, therefore they would interfere with the transmission of the breath sounds as well as vibrations. So the, so the breath sounds as well as frematous would be decreased in all of these conditions. With the atelectasis, since the lungs have collapsed, therefore there won't be any airflow inside that area, and also the vibration is lessened through the areas that have undergone collapse. So atelectasis will also decrease the frematis. On the other hand, with consolidation, since there is now fluid that is inside the lungs, therefore there would be better transmission of vibrations. So just note, with the pleural effusion, fluids is inside the pleural cavity, which is like a shield. It inhibits the transmission of vibrations through the lungs versus consolidation there are fluids that are inside the lung itself and thus transmission of vibrations are better the other term you have to be familiar with is called bronchial breath sounds so conditions that cause consolidation of the lung like pneumonia or pulmonary edema cause bronchial breath sounds on auscultation. So what happens when you're listening over the bronchia in the um, second or third intercostal space, you will hear the sound of inspiration like this, and then the sound of expiration. So the duration of inspiration and expiration are the same, and this is referred to as bronchial breath sounds. On the other hand, if you listen to the breath sounds in the periphery of the lungs or base of the lung, you will hear inspiration like this. And then expiration is a much shorter period. So this is referred to as vesicular breath sounds. And the reason for that is that it takes longer for the periphery of the lungs to get filled with inspiration, while with expiration, periphery is the first part that gets um, emptied from the air. So therefore, the duration of inspiration would be longer than expiration when listening to the periphery of the lungs. Now, with conditions that cause consolidation of the lung, whether it's pneumonia or pulmonary edema, part of the lung is blocked with the fluids. So the air cannot go inside that area anymore. So therefore, it takes less time to fill the lungs with the air, and thus the duration of the inspiration and expiration would be equal. So you will hear so now listening to the periphery of the lung, you no longer hear vesicular breath sounds, but rather you will hear bronchial breath sounds because the duration of inspiration and expiration are now the same. So therefore, with consolidations, what you will hear on auscultation is bronchial breath sounds. And then one other feature of consolidation is that you will hear late inspiratory crackles. So towards the end of the inspiration, you will hear some crackles. So late inspiratory crackles is another feature of the pneumonia or pulmonary edema. Now in terms of percussion, once you're percussing on something hard, like for instance, if you percuss on a stone, you will hear a dull sound. While if you hit on a drum, it would be a hyper resonant sound. So with pneumothorax, since there is air that is inside the pleural cavity, there would be a hyper resonant sound on the percussion. While with the atelectasis, since the lungs has collapsed, it would be dull. And then with the pleural effusions as well as consolidation, since there is fluid that you are percussing over, therefore the sound would again be dull. And then with the atelectasis, since the lung has collapsed, there would be opening of some space. So therefore trachea will deviate towards
the lesion side because the space has been opened on the side of the lesion. Same with spontaneous pneumothorax, which is due to the rupture of subpleural blebs, as a consequence of which new space opens up. So trachea will again deviate towards the lesion side versus tension pneumothorax will air will flow inside the pleural cavity as a consequence of which it will push everything away so therefore with the tension pneumothorax like for instance someone who has a knife stab into the chest and air will be flowing inside the pleural cavity everything will be pushed away so trachea will be pushed away from the lesion side Okay, now here is another diagram that will show you that the intercostal muscles are connected to the lungs via the pleural cavity. So pleural cavity is made of a parietal pleura as well as visceral pleura. And then the area inside has a vacuum of minus 5 centimeter water pressure. So once the chest wall is expanding, since there is a vacuum here and the uh, pleural cavity is connecting it to the lungs, therefore the lungs will expand as well. So here is another diagram that shows you that the lungs and the chest wall are connected to each other via the pleural cavity. And the red line shows the balance between these two. So the lungs has a tendency to recoil on itself while the chest wall has a tendency to spring out. So therefore, the balance between the lungs and the chest wall is shown here with the red line. So conditions that will lose elasticity of the lungs, for instance, emphysema, will make the um, system to shift towards the chest. And then the conditions that will make the lung more stiff, like for instance, fibrosis, since the lung is no longer as compliant, will be pushed away. The, the system will be pushed down because the chest wall cannot resist it. And so the whole thing will be pushed inside. Now, here with the um, pneumothorax, what happens is that air will be flowed inside the pleural cavity, while with the pleural effusion, there is fluid that will go inside here. And we also have empyema where there would be pus that is inside the pleural cavity. And with all of these conditions, what happens is that since there is now not a good connection between the um, chest wall as well as the lungs, therefore patients will have difficulty with breathing. So here is an example of a pleural effusion, which can be diagnosed with either chest x-ray or CT. And what you will see is that the costophrenic angle is now there is a blunting of it. So how you can see on this side, you can't see the costophrenic angle anymore. So therefore, one characteristic feature of pleural effusion is blunting of the costophrenic angle. And so the difference between the right and the left image is that both of them are from the same patient. So here, after performing the thoraco Centesis, the patient have lost some of the fluids in the pleural cavity and so you can see that there is some space that has opened up and so you can see that with the pleural effusion since there is fluid that blocks transmission of the breath sounds as well as vibrations therefore there would be decreased breath sounds as well as decreased fremitus and once you percuss on it since there is fluid that is underneath therefore there would be a dull sound on percussion now there are two forms of the pleural effusions that you have to be familiar with and the first one is transudative pleural effusions which is from the increased capillary pressure like for instance in patients that have congestive heart failure as a consequence of which secondary to pulmonary hypertension will cause leakage of the fluid and thus patients can develop transudative pleural effusions and then on the other hand it could be from decreased plasma oncotic pressure like for instance in patients that have cirrhosis and thus not enough albumin is formed or in patients that have nephrotic syndrome where the protein from the plasma is being excreted inside the urine since now there is less protein inside plasma of the blood therefore there would be decreased oncotic pressure and again fluid will start to leak out into the pleural space and then the other form is called exudative pleural effusion which is due to the increased permeability of the pleural spaces that is seen in patients that have for instance malignancy tuberculosis as well as bacterial pneumonia.
And so with these conditions, either from pleural inflammation or disrupted lymphatic drainage, there would be leakage of fluid inside the pleural space. And then in order to distinguish transudative from exudative, you can obtain the fluids from thoracocentesis and then send it for analysis. If the ratio of the pleura to serum protein is more than 0.5, or if the lactate dehydrogenase of the pleura to serum is again more than 0.6, it indicates that the fluid is an exudate, and thus there is a risk of malignancy, tuberculosis, or pneumonia in these patients that you will have to discover. And then finally, we have empyema, which is from the presence of the pus inside the pleural cavity. And the most causative organism for the empyema is Staphylococcus aureus, and the analysis of the fluid will show that the pleural pH, the fluid, has a pH of less than 7.2 and or the glucose would be less than 60. And then the conditions that can increase the risk of empyema include tuberculosis as well as malignancy. And so for the treatment of these patients, you have to perform thoracocentesis, and then you can also provide them with the antibiotics. Now, in terms of the exudative pleural effusions, you will have to treat the underlying disorder, like for instance, malignancy, tuberculosis, or pneumonia. And then finally, in patients that have transudative pleural effusion, since it's from the excess fluid that is getting inside the pleural cavity, you can provide them with the diuretics, and of course, you can also perform the thoracocentesis to get rid of some of the fluids. The next condition is atelectasis, where there is a complete or partial collapse of a lung or a lobe of the lung. And it usually develops when the alveoli are collapsing and thus airs can no longer get through them. Now, there are two forms of atelectasis. One is obstructive, like for instance, in children that have a mucus plug, Therefore, there is an increased risk of atelectasis development. Other causes of atelectasis are non-obstructive, like for instance, from parenchymal compression, from surfactant dysfunction, as well as from the um, accelerated forces, like for instance, pilots and astronauts, where there is too much acceleration on the lungs, which will cause atelectasis. Now, surfactant is a very important factor in preventing atelectasis. And in order to understand that, you have to know that the collapsing pressure of the lung is equal to times surface tension divided by the radius. And so the mnemonic that I have for you is called Peter. So P, collapsing pressure, equals T divided by R. P equals T divided by R. And then there are two E's that are surrounding the T. So 2 times T divided by R is the equation that we have here. So conditions that increase the tension, like for instance, from the lack of the surfactant, therefore there would be increased collapsing pressure and so increased risk of atelectasis. For instance, in children with premature birth, since there is low level of surfactant, they're at increased risk of atelectasis and developing neonatal uh, respiratory distress syndrome. On the other hand, radius is an important factor in preventing the atelectasis. So the higher the radius of the lung, the less chance of atelectasis, while the lower the radius, the higher chance of the uh, collapse because the collapsing pressure increases. So here, let me show you an example to better understand how radius is playing an important role in preventing the atelectasis. So let's say that we have two balloons that are connected together, one really large balloon and one small balloon. And then you let air flow out of these balloons. My question is, which of these balloons is going to empty first? And the answer is the small balloon will empty first because it has a lower radius, smaller radius, as a consequence of which the collapsing pressure will increase. So this one is the first one to empty because of too much collapsing pressure. And so that's the reason that patients that are uh, coming back from the surgery, they keep asking them to inspire deep inside the spirometry, and this way it will keep expanding the lungs and thus prevent the development of the atelectasis. And so the findings that you will have in patients that have atelectasis, since part of the lung has collapsed, there would be decreased breath sounds as well as decreased transmission of the vibrations. And then on percussion, there is dullness. Now, since atelectasis, part of the lung has collapsed, there would be new space that has opened up. 
So trachea will deviate towards the lesion side. And here I have an image that show you that the lung has collapsed in the right inferior lobe. The next condition is pneumothorax, where there would be air that goes inside the pleural cavity. And so since air goes inside the pleural cavity, it would let the lungs recoil on itself because the lung has tendency to recoil on itself. So by having either air or fluid inside the pleural cavity, there would be dissociation between the chest wall and the lungs. And so therefore, the lungs will recoil on itself. So there are two forms of the pneumothorax that you have to be familiar with. Uh, spontaneous versus tension. So spontaneous is from the rupture of the sub pleural blebs. And there are two forms of spontaneous pneumothorax. Primary, which is in healthy individuals, and these individuals are usually tall, thin, young men who usually develop rupture of the sub pleural blebs at the apex of the lungs. And so since a new space opens up with the spontaneous pneumothorax, the mediastinum as well as the trachea will shift towards the lesion side. With the secondary pneumothorax, there are some complications of the underlying disease, like for instance COPD, cystic fibrosis, where there would be increased risk of the rupture of the subpleural blebs. Or in patients that have tuberculosis, there could be a rupture of the tuberculosis cavity, as a consequence of which there would be pneumothorax that would develop. And then the other form of pneumothorax is tension pneumothorax, where there would be air that will enter the pleural cavity. And since air will enter, it would shift everything away, including the mediastinum and the trachea. So everything will shift away from the lesion. Since now that there is air in the pleural space, there would be hyper resonance on percussions. There would be decreased breath sounds because of two reasons. One, lung has recoiled on itself. And two, the air will act as a barrier and prevent transmission of the breath sounds. These patients will also have hypotension because of the compression of the great vessels. And so since there is too much compression of the great vessels as well as the heart, Blood cannot return to the heart either, and so there would be distended neck veins as well. So here is an example of a spontaneous and tension pneumothorax. So you, here you can see that with the spontaneous pneumothorax, the lung has collapsed on itself, and supposedly you should see that the trachea deviates towards the lesion side. But in reality, you don't usually see that because there is not much space that has opened up. But for the purpose of examinations, just know that with the spontaneous pneumothorax, trachea will shift towards the lesion sides. While with the tension pneumothorax, air has entered the pleural cavity and it pushes everything away. So here you can see that the trachea and mediastinum and everything has pushed away from the lesion side. So here is the table that we have. There would be decreased breath sounds with the pneumothorax. And since now that there is air inside the pleural cavity, there would be decreased transmission of the vibrations as well. And so once you percuss on the area, since it's hollow, there would be hyper resonant on percussion. With the spontaneous pneumothorax, trachea will deviate towards the lesion sides, while with the tension pneumothorax, it will deviate away from the lesion side. And then the final conditions are consolidations of the lung, like for instance pulmonary edema, that is shown right here, or the pneumonia, that is shown in this other image. And with the consolidations, as we discussed earlier, there would be bronchial breath sounds, so there won't be any more vesicular breath sounds, but rather they would be bronchial breath sounds. And then there would be also late inspiratory crackles, on auscultation. Since there is fluid in the areas, there would be dullness to percussion. And since vibrations transmit better through fluids than through the air, therefore there would be increased fremitus. And that concludes the discussion of the lung lesions.